Good morning, church. It's a pleasure to worship with you. We remember Christ risen from the grave this morning. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Good morning. He is risen. He's risen. risen <laughs> That's right. Yes, we serve a risen Savior today. I'm so glad that you've uh, joined us this morning. I want to read uh, right, right from the story from, from Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 1. It says, But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? And in verse six, he is not here, but he is risen. And church, uh, there is nothing greater in, in the history of the world than this, this story that we have a Savior who came and lived a perfect life, who, who died, who took our place, gave us a way to make a right relationship with God, gave us freedom from the guilt, the shame, the sin that so gripped us. We know it didn't end with his death, but he rose. He claimed victory over death. And, you know, Paul says that if, if, if Christ hasn't risen, then our faith is, is worthless. It's futile. But we know for sure, we trust and believe that Jesus certainly did rise from the dead. And our faith is indeed intact and it is indeed powerful. And I hope that, or I think that this, this whole thing we've been dealing with, this coronavirus and all this, it really hope it, maybe it's stripped down our faith to the very basics. We don't need all the, the consumerism that we, that we find in Christianity. We compare all these different things and, and, and churches, and we try to be entertained by the church and all these things. It is about our Savior that we gather together to serve, and we, we want to be together to do that and, and serve him and glorify him and praise him. And that's really what it's about. So I pray that you will be in a right mindset today what truly is is important what truly matters in this life and for eternity that you will just worship with us today 
worshiping our risen Savior and sing along with us from home. Chapter 15, verse 55 and 57, it says, O oh death, where is your victory? O oh death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Church, we have many things to be thankful for this morning. But the greatest thing we need to be thankful for is that Jesus has conquered the grave. He has conquered our sin. He has conquered our death. Because of that, we can rejoice this morning knowing nothing can stop our Lord this morning. And nothing will stop him in the ages to come. So let's sing together. Who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Yeah. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Nothing can stop the Lord. Oh, who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. For the sin of the world, his blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before him. Oh, 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 oh,
let's continue to worship. We introduced a song last week. We hope that we can sing along once again. The story of the cross. He became. He became one of the lowly, one of us yet full of glory. But I'm flesh, blood, and bone came to earth and left your throne. And all the story of the cross, what a victory at such a cost. Behold the risen and spotless Lamb, the coming King, the great I Am. He saw the outcast, the sick and poor, come see the one we've waited for. Perfect love and justice seen. Oh, praise the Lord who was was And all the story of the cross, what a victory at such a cost. Behold the thank you that you are the coming king that you are reigning on your throne that you have conquered death on our behalf that there's no longer a sting of death that death is no longer victorious God but that you are and so father we are so thankful for that great miracle for that great truth this morning on Easter Sunday. Lord, thank you. I pray that your scripture would speak to us, that you would touch our hearts, Father, wherever we may be in this season, Lord, I pray you would speak to us, that we would remember the great truth and good news that you are risen indeed. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
This is usually the time in our service where we have a chance to continue in our worship by giving our tithes and offerings to the Lord, and we encourage you to continue to uh, take advantage of that. Uh, if you would give to uh, this church, if you are part of the Garner Advocate Christian Church, uh, we, uh, we encourage you to do that, or a ministry you're involved with. We uh, just want to make you aware of that. And I want to read some scripture. Uh, Dan read the first part of it, but we're going to look into uh, chapter 24, but we're going to start in verse 13, and it starts this way. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still with their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all of this happened. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that he had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are. And how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while we talked While he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us, they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. And then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Now I have something important to say to you as we start this service. You know what it is? Easter hasn't been canceled. You can't quarantine our Easter hope. Jesus is risen. Death is defeated. Amen. Put your hands to heaven, if you will. Even if you're sitting in front of that TV, put your hands to heaven. And I'm sorry for the spoiler alert, but sometimes the ending is so good that you just need to skip to it. You know, sometimes what I'll do, I'll go to my DVR, and I'll go to some of the programs that that I've DVR'd and saved, and and I'll put them on, and I, not long ago, I remember watching, putting on the Patriots Super Bowl, and I turned it on, and the Patriots are down 28-3 to in the fourth quarter, and it's not looking good, and the announcer is saying, this is the, the biggest deficit any team, no team has ever come back from a deficit like this, but you know what the best part is? To be able to take that remote and fast forward it to the point where I hear touchdown Patriots, New England Patriots are Super Bowl champions. They've been resurrected, if you will. Or I can go to It's a Wonderful Life, and I have George Bailey (laughs) contemplating suicide over an $8,000 deficit in his building and loan company. But you know what the best part is? Again, I take that remote and I fast forward it all the way to the end where the town of Bedford Falls is in George Bailey's house. And George's brother Harry is saying, here's a toast to my big brother, George, the richest man in town. But you know what's really fantastic? To be able to take my Bible and read on Friday a bloodied, bloodied, 
and dying Jesus, crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But then I'm able to skip to verse 24. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Praise God that we know the ending and we can skip right to the rejoicing. But here's the problem. What happens if you can't skip ahead and you're stuck in Friday? This is the problem with Cleopas. I'm going to call him Cleo. And his anonymous walking friend in the story that I just read to you. It's Easter morning. The tomb is empty. But these two followers, who by the way are just ordinary followers. They're not superstar disciples like Peter, James, and John. Uh, They're just ordinary vanilla disciples. And they're taking the Emmaus exit out of Jerusalem which is a seven-mile walk. But something doesn't make sense to me when I read this story. I want to ask Cleo and his friend, you were there Easter morning when Mary breathlessly burst in the room saying, the tomb is empty. Empty. We saw the angels who told us that he was alive. And weren't you there when your friends investigated the tomb and came back to report, it's true, the tomb is empty. So, Cleo, why did you bolt out of Jerusalem with the outcome still in doubt? Why didn't you stay until you knew the truth? Well, their answer is found in three words in verse 21. And these three words are, we had hoped. We had hoped that Jesus was our Redeemer. But when they crucified him, our hope died with him. So we're going home. And that makes sense to me because what's the counsel that we give to people who've been crushed by grief? We typically say to them, don't make any sudden major changes. Stay with the familiar. They're going home to what they knew. They're going home to the familiar because their hope is dead. And they're afraid to resurrect it. They can't get past Friday because it's too painful, too painful to let themselves hope again because you got to know when to quit and to move on with your life. You know, in the movie Shawshank Redemption, there's an inmate, an institutionalized inmate and felon named Red, and he befriends a fellow inmate by the name of Andy. And in one scene, Red warns Andy, and he says these words, Let me tell you something. Hope is a dangerous thing. Hope can drive a man insane. It's got no use on the inside. You better get used to that idea. And some of you watching right now, you can relate to Red's philosophy. And you could say, you know what I found in my life? That hope is a dangerous thing. Because hoping means believing again. And opening my heart again. And reopening old wounds. And and actually, it's so much easier to let hope stay buried. And then to move on with my life. So you choose to live perpetually stuck in Friday. So Cleo and his walking buddy exited before Jesus' victory over death was official. They missed the victory. And so the victory came to them. Two ordinary, hopeless followers. Verse 15, we read, As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along. Now this is amazing because Jesus shows up in all his grave busting resurrection power. And Cleo and his buddy don't recognize him. And if you're a fan of CSI, you begin to start the investigation in your mind. Did Jesus shave his beard? Did he disguise himself? Did he alter his voice in some way? But the Bible tells us that they were prevented from recognizing Jesus. Why? But that's not my only question. 
Why does Jesus then play dumb with them? He approaches them and says, what are you all, are you all talking about? We'll make Jesus a little southern version here. And they say to him, are you kidding me? Are you just a visitor to Jerusalem that you're unaware of what's happened this weekend? And Jesus responds with, what things? <laughs> I have to tell you, I had two teenage boys, two teenage sons, and playing dumb was always their fallback strategy. I could say to them, who ate the rest of this cereal but left the empty box in the cupboard? And I would hear, what cereal? I could say to them, look, I have a progress report here from your teachers, and they tell me that you're missing your homework assignments. What do you have to say to your, for yourself? Oh, what homework assignments? <laughs> this isn't the resurrected Jesus that we expect. Where is the big reveal? Instead, Jesus shrouds his identity in mystery, and he plays dumb like my high school boys. But the Bible tells us this. The Bible tells us that Jesus knew the hearts of men. And he knew that he was dealing with two grieving, hopeless followers who, despite the empty tomb, just could not get past Friday. And he also knew exactly why they were stuck. Something was wrong with their hope. Something that couldn't be fixed by him just showing up in a blaze of glory. Cue the music. I am Jesus, the conqueror of death. So Jesus played dumb with them to get them to articulate their hope. And here's what they say in verse 19. Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. This was our hope. But it's dead and buried. But I want you to know Jesus' reaction, because again, it's unexpected. And he says, how foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things, and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Now Jesus begins by lightly scolding them. Don't you know and believe the scriptures? And then Jesus engaged them. Listen to this. He engaged them in a two-hour Bible study while they walked to Emmaus. A two-hour Bible study on Easter morning with two hopeless followers? Surely Jesus had more important things to do. Can you imagine our live stream if it began this way, where Kelly stood up and said, Morning, church. We serve a risen Savior. And we're going to worship a little bit. And then Pastor Kenny is going to come. He's going to lead us in a two-hour Old Testament Bible study on the prophecy pointing to Jesus. How many of you would log off almost immediately, log off Facebook, log off YouTube? My wife wouldn't sit through that. And she loves me a whole lot. So why would Jesus take a good part of Easter morning to not only find these two hopeless ordinary followers and walk alongside them incognito, but then to lead them in a two-hour Bible study to troubleshoot their hope. How do you explain that? There's only one explanation. It's called the love of Christ. And so when Jesus troubleshooted their hope, he immediately found the source of their hopelessness. Because remember what they said. They said, we had hoped that Jesus was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Our hope was in a Messiah who would be our Moses and lead us to political freedom from our oppressors, our oppressors being Rome, that he would free us from our suffering. But Jesus said, no, no. Let me quote what the scriptures really say. 
And he began to quote Old Testament scriptures from memory. And undoubtedly, he quoted Isaiah 53, as I quote for you. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Cleo, do you see it? This is why you're stuck in Friday. You've misplaced your hope in the wrong Messiah. The one who will set Israel free from suffering. But God's truth is found in a Messiah who will set all men free, not just Israel, all men free from sin by suffering. And once you grasp this truth, your hope will be renewed in the true Messiah. How many of you have ever experienced misplaced hope? Maybe you put your hopes and dreams in the perfect woman and the perfect man. You gave them your heart and soul until your heart was broken by them. Maybe you put all your hope in your kids. You gave them your, your heart and, and your soul and a lot of your money to help them succeed in life. But they've been a disappointment. You still love them and you didn't expect them to still be living with you in their 40s. Maybe you put all your hope in a career. He made the sacrifice of, of time and energy and even the sacrifice of, of your family. But just when you were at the top rung of the ladder of success, you were tossed off the ladder. You were called into an office where someone said, we're going to downsize, we're going to have to let you go. Or we need someone else that has a little more experience. Hasn't the virus taught us the danger of misplaced hope? How quickly... We've discovered that you can lose your health or your job or your stock investments or even the basic freedoms that you're accustomed to. And today, there are those of you watching who have spiritual misplaced hopes. And what do I mean by that? Well, maybe your hope is in being a good person, at least, at least good enough to get into heaven when it's all said and done. Maybe your hope is in believing. You would say, what matters most is that I just believe in God. Or maybe your hope is in doing good works. If I can just do enough good things, if I can just serve and give, and I'll get a free pass from Peter when I show up at the pearly gates. Misplaced hopes. But have you ever had a, a, a friend or a mentor or a coach or a teacher or a youth pastor, someone who took the time to walk alongside you and to listen to your hopes or maybe to hear you talk about the hopes that have died long ago and were, these folks were able to say to you, look, because I love you, I have to tell you the truth. Your hope is misplaced. When I was 15, I had a youth leader who took me under his wing. And he would call me up and we would get together. We would have lunch together or we would go and shoot some baskets or we would play some catch. And in the course of conversation, he would always troubleshoot my hope. I remember him saying things like this to me. You love sports, but don't make it your idol because the odds are you'll never be a professional. Make Jesus the life you build upon. 
Kenny, you know that, uh, that cute girl you're dating? Yeah. Well, that's not the girl that God has for you. God has a girl for you that will, that will love Jesus like you do. Now, did I always love his hope, troubleshooting counsel? No. But I knew that he loved me enough to build a relationship with me and to be able to speak God's truth into my heart and into my life. And that was a huge inspiration to me becoming a youth pastor. So thank you, Bernie Bows. This is exactly what Jesus offered to Cleopas or Cleo and his friend. And it's exactly what he offers to you this morning. As you've been walking this symbolic road to Emmaus with your hopelessness, with your doubts, with your disappointments, with your heartache, with your grief, the resurrected Christ has been walking beside you, softly speaking his truth into your heart. I am alive. I am the true Messiah. I do love you. I will renew your hope. There isn't a person, now listen when I say this, there isn't a person alive whose heart Jesus isn't willing to seek and engage. And that's important because I come in contact with Emmaus travelers all the time who are emotionally stuck back in Friday. They say to me things like this, one day when I get my life together, I'll get back to church and I'll get right with God. And you know what that translation means? Well, let me translate it for you. Until I make my life and heart acceptable to God, until I find my hope, until I solve my doubt, until I find the right halo size, God won't accept me. But that isn't the good news of Easter. Verse 28. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us. For it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. But finally, their eyes were open to Jesus. Was it a prayer? Was it a, a glimpse of his nail-scarred hands when he broke the bread? We don't know. But do you think it was a coincidence that their eyes were opened over a dinner table? The dinner table being the centerpiece of relational bonding. You see, Jesus wants to be more than just an anonymous stranger in your life. He wants a relationship with you and me. And Jesus spent hours in intimate dialogue with Cleo and his friend. He purposely created this relational context where he could know their hearts and where he could be mutually known and recognized. That's relationship. Eons ago, I was basically an anonymous stranger to a very cute co-ed on my college campus. So I walked up to her one day and I said, I'm Kenny Lattimore. I'm five foot nine, 145 pounds. I'm an elementary education major. And I have a secret fear that God is calling me into ministry. And my parents, they've had some marital scars, but I think they've turned the corner. And I'm praying that I will find a godly wife. And if God answers my prayer, it could be you. And Kim's reaction was, security? I'm joking. That's not how we become fully known. Instead, our first date, we did a reverse Emmaus date. First, we ate a, a leisurely dinner at an Italian restaurant, and no, I didn't disappear after breaking a dinner roll. And then we went on a three-hour walk in a frigid, cold, misty rain. But to tell you the truth, I was oblivious. That three-hour walk seemed like a stroll with her because we were getting to know one another. And that intimate night of dinner and dialogue is one of Kim and I's favorite memories. 
But why did I initiate that Emmaus date to create a relational context where I could reveal myself and my heart and be known by him and she me? This is Jesus' desire for you and for me. In John 14, 23, he says, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. Christian author Brennan Manning has what might be my favorite quote. And he says these words, which is so true. The miracle of the gospel is Christ, risen and glorified, who this very moment tracks us, pursues us, abides in us, and offers himself to us as a companion for the journey. Relationship. Verse 32. Cleo and his, and his friend begin to debrief, and they say these words. Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Our hearts we're being changed. And it's still amazing to me how our risen Savior works in human hearts. That he still has the power to resurrect dead and buried hope through his truth. And through his presence in relationship. And most of all, through his love. In closing, I want to share another quote. It's by a name, man by the name of Roger Garuti, and he says this, I do not know much about Jesus, but I do know this, that his whole life conveys one message. Anyone, at any moment, can start a new future. That, my friends, is the promise of hope. Do any of you need a hope transfusion today? Show 
As we close our service today, I pray that you have that hope of Jesus Christ that resides in your life and in your heart. If you have that hope, I pray that today is a great celebration for you. And I pray that even the time we've had to worship together has just been just a reminder and a renewal of, of, of what, you, what you have in your heart. But just for a moment, I just want to speak to those that, that still might be stuck in Friday. And what I mean by that is perhaps the hope you've had, the hopes you've had in your life, you're not at that place. It's, it's died. And you need, you need a hope in your life. And up to this point, maybe you've been afraid. You've been afraid. And hope's a dangerous thing can drive a man insane in the words of red. But what you've heard today is that Jesus is the ultimate help. He has the truth. He is the truth. He gave his life to forgive your sin so that you might be able to enter into relationship with him. That you, he will walk with you day by day. Change your life. Change your destiny. You can experience that today. And I pray that you would turn to the living Lord because he has risen. He has risen indeed. Amen.